So, good evening. Welcome uh, to this uh, Chancellor's uh, Center for Advanced Study Lecture Series, uh, the second lecture in the series. Uh, I, the director of the Center for Advanced Studies is, is with us tonight, Bill Greenow. Um, this series began uh, through sort of a brainstorming session about how we might uh, uh, take some of our work, uh, wonderful work that takes place on the campus, and, and speak, uh, speak about it in a way that uh, the public would, would understand it, and sort of recognizing this as an obligation of, of a great public university. And as Dave gave me uh, this little profile of him that appears in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and I was I haven't gotten through it all day, but I, I did get far enough to know that uh, you too ate liver as a young child. So, <laughs> well, I do want to say after after the uh, uh, lecture this evening, there will be a reception in preparation for official St. Patrick's Day, I guess. <laughs> well, nights like tonight remind me why I, I treasure my life in the academy. Every year brings new research, fresh perspectives, and exciting discoveries. As chancellor, I get to hear about all the groundbreaking work our faculty does every day. And tonight, I'm glad you have the opportunity to join me as we hear from Professor David Baker as part of the chancellor's CAS lecture series. <laughs> Actually, the truth is I feel like a kid in a candy store a lot of the time. And it's such a, it's such a great pleasure. Well, in order for our work here to be useful, for our research to have meaning beyond these walls, we must share it with the world. We must transform information into knowledge. This lecture series is designed to do just that. Tonight is the second installment, as I said, in a series I value greatly. The first speaker was Gene Robinson. Well, that's some of the most accomplished scholars on this campus have been asked and will be asked to speak as part of this series so that they can share their research with the community, so that we can strengthen the connection between what we do and those who benefit from our research. As part of the Illinois family, we're charged with important tasks. We have an obligation to our students, not only to educate them, but to prepare them to live a life in which doing well is entwined with doing good. We have an obligation to our state, our nation, our world, to serve as a center of scientific discovery and uniquely creative research. Above all, we have an obligation to those who don't even realize they need us, to those who don't necessarily know what happens in the lab, but who do know that their animals are healthier because of advances made in animal science at Illinois, the number one department in the country. Neil, you here? <laughs> and, and Bob Easter is here. So. You know, had things gone a little differently, David Baker might be selling slacks today instead of delivering this lecture. See, we did do a little homework, Dave. <laughs> That's because during his first semester at Illinois in 1957, David was one of the many people who caught the Asian flu. He fell behind in his classes and dropped out, although there's more to that story, I gather, <laughs> taking a job in a men's clothing store. Fortunately, David realized his life's passion wasn't off the rack, but in the lab. He came back to classes that spring and went on to become one of the most accomplished professors at Illinois. His work as a comparative nutritionist has enhanced the world's understanding of human and animal dietary requirements. His research has improved the quality of feed and the understanding of disease. His passion, focus, and drive have earned him a place among the nation's most respected scientists. Last year, he was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences he is one of 29 distinguished scientists on campus to receive this honor. Dave? <laughs> Dave.
David's dedication to Illinois provides an example for each of us to follow. His colleagues appreciate his leadership and scholarship. His students appreciate his support and encouragement. And this university is better for his presence. As David will soon explain, sometimes what we find isn't always what we're looking for. That's when the kind of open mind and creative spirit found at Illinois seizes upon a chance of dis discovery, elevating its significance into the realm of excellent research. And excellence is at the heart of who we are at Illinois. So thank you for joining us tonight, and please help me welcome David Baker. Thank you, Richard, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, our session tonight conflicts with the basketball game, so I certainly appreciate all you being here tonight. Uh, I think all of us that have engaged in hypothesis-driven science have experienced uh, serendipity. And uh, it's a subject I've been interested in for for many years, actually since probably graduate school, because it happens. And I think it takes a degree of sagacity to, uh, to know when and how to capitalize on it. And that's what I'd like to talk to you tonight about. Uh, so just briefly, I think we all know that serendipity, as indicated here, is the gift of finding valuable or agreeable things that we really weren't seeking, or the faculty of making fortunate and unexpected discoveries <clears throat> by accident. It's interesting, the word itself was not in modern dictionaries until 1974. Even though the word was coined, actually, clear back in 1754 by Horace Walpole, who in a letter to his friend Sir Horace Mann commented about a fairy tale situation that he found fascinating, namely the three princes of Serendip. Serendip is the ancient name for the country of Ceylon, now known better as uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, he became fascinated by all the accidental discoveries that were, were mentioned in that uh, fairy tale and realized that he himself had experienced the same thing and so he coined the word serendipity. <clears throat> but it's what we might say Velcro, Post-its, Teflon, penicillin, x-rays, dynamite, the Dead Sea Scrolls, rubber tires, and you could go on with a list that's much, much longer. Uh, they, they occurred by accidental discovery. And today, books are written about this subject. This is one of my favorites uh, by Royston Roberts, actually a PhD from the University of Illinois in organic chemistry, and he's a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. So what I'd like to do tonight is simply go through some examples from my own research program <clears throat> where we've made accidental discoveries that we have found exciting, and I think they're, they're relevant. But before I do that, I'd like to briefly just recount some of the great discoveries that have been made in the nutritional sciences during the 20th century. And I'll start with my main area of research, protein and amino acids, even though I'm not going to talk much about that tonight. But during the 20th century, all 20 of the amino acids found in protein were discovered. We realized and, and proved that nine cannot be synthesized in the body at all. There is one additional one that is synthesized in limited quantity, but not in optimal quantity for at least maximal growth. And it was right here at the University of Illinois in the 40s that W.C. Rose coined the words essential and non-essential amino acids. Uh, essential being those that must be provided in the diet because we can't synthesize them. Non-essential 
obviously being they don't have to be in the diet because they can be made in the body from other amino acids or from nitrogen sources. The other thing that <clears throat> has occurred more recently, particularly since the discovery of the structure of DNA in the 50s, is that we now understand how protein is synthesized. And uh, it, it's fascinating to me to think that there's probably upwards of 25,000 different proteins floating around in our bodies right now as we sit here in this room. Each one of those proteins has a unique amino acid profile, and each one requires a specific genetic code for its synthesis. Pretty amazing. <clears throat> We've also established in the 20th century that there are 15 essential mineral elements. In other words, they have to be present in the diet. There's an additional uh, six what we call ultra-trace elements. These would be elements like vanadium, tin, nickel, silicon. They have function, but they don't have to be in the diet because they're simply enough contaminating the environment to meet the requirements. We pretty well know the functionality of each of those essential mineral elements. And it's uh, rather amazing and intriguing to me the diversity of the absorption efficiency of each of those mineral elements. Uh, to give you the extremes, you have elements like sodium, potassium, iodide, chloride, and fluoride, where literally 100% of what you consume will be absorbed from the GI tract into the bloodstream. <clears throat> and then we get down to elements like iron and zinc, where only about 20% of those elements are going to be absorbed from a food matrix. And of course, we, we need iron to transport oxygen from the lungs to the cells of the body. And we need zinc to transport carbon dioxide, the end product of carbon metabolism in the cells, to the lungs so that we can expire carbon dioxide. <clears throat> and we even have some elements that are absorbed much less efficiently than iron and zinc. For example, manganese, we think, is absorbed at the rate of about 5%. And the least efficiently absorbed essential mineral element is chromium. And we're still learning new things about chromium. <clears throat> there are 14 essential vitamins. Virtually all of this was done during the 20th century. And no fewer than 19 Nobel Prizes were awarded for the discovery of these vitamins and how they function in health and how we can prevent deficiency diseases such as night blindness due to vitamin A or rickets due to uh, <clears throat> vitamin D deficiency, uh, pernicious anemia due to B12 deficiency, and pellagra due to uh, niacin deficiency. So a real exciting uh, era during the uh, discovery of these essential vitamins, and we'll talk a bit more about this uh, later. Yes, we need fat, some fat in the diet, because there are two essential fatty acids. And they have to be present in the diet. Uh, actually, there are three fatty acids when we're dealing with uh, feline species, members of the cat family, who evolved as strict carnivores because they can't make arachidonic acid. Uh, but we clearly need two essential fatty acids in our diet. And we've learned a lot about fiber and co carbohydrates. Uh, great uh, progress has been made in, in analytically in assaying fiber. We used to think of fiber as simply cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. And we now know that there are all kinds of other components of, of the fiber fraction. There are gums and uh, uh, things of that type, indigestible starches, and so forth. And in the area of carbohydrates, we're now having to deal with the term glycemic index, which basically means the quality of a food or a diet to increase blood glucose. And by better understanding glycemic index, uh, I think it leads to progress in how to deal with things like diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and also in terms of weight control. 
Well, the first example <coughs> that I'd like to give you in terms of serendipity involves uh, copper. And I'm just going to kind of go through and tell you some stories from my own uh, experience. We had worked on uh, copper, had been interested in copper, because uh, copper at pharmacologic dose levels is fed to food producing animals because it produces growth. It, it, I mean, it increases growth. Uh, it has a mild antibacterial spectrum. And uh, we had done some work with copper back in the 70s. And our interest then was at these pharmacologic dose levels, about 20 times the minimal requirement, it impaired sulfur amino acid absorption, the absorption of the amino acids methionine and cysteine. We would pretty much dropped the subject uh, until for about 15 years, and this is where serendipity comes in. I was attending a conference in Chicago. There were multiple sessions going on, and uh, I, as you frequently have at these meetings. There wasn't a session I particularly wanted to attend, so I was kind of wandering down the hall. And uh, I heard this person in one of the rooms talking about copper and copper sources. And he was going on and on about how great copper oxide was uh, as a source of copper. Uh, and I found that quite intriguing because the standard had always been copper sulfate. And copper salt, most copper salts are blue or blue-green. Notice that pure analytical grade copper oxide or cupric oxide is black. And I found myself driving home from that meeting uh, thinking, uh, I just can't believe that copper oxide could be as well utilized or as well absorbed as sulfates or chlorides of copper. And uh, <clears throat> so we decided that we probably needed to take a look at this. And uh, we began looking into the literature and discovered that virtually all the trace mineral premixes that were being used to feed animals, including companion animals and food animals, were using this source of copper. We later learned that vitamin mineral pills that are being taken by humans, we're also using cupric oxide. So we thought, well, let's take a look at this. Let's see if it's really as good as what this company is actually a company person that was saying this, as good as they say it is. And so we wanted to develop a bioavailability assay. And the first thing you have to do when you do that is to find something that responds linearly to doses of copper. The requirement for copper, and actually we, we did these kinds of studies in chicks and also pigs and in rats. But, and it's pretty much the same in all species. I'm going to show you the chick data. But notice as you go from 10 parts per million of copper up to 200, nothing happens to liver copper measured in parts per million. <clears throat> but between 200 and 500 parts per million, it increases about tenfold. So we thought that would be the basis of a bioavailability assay. We simply need to compare sources of copper and look at the slope of this line. So we put cupric oxide in our assay system, and lo and behold, we got a flat line. And I need not tell you that that indicates that it's not being utilized, because if you don't find it in the liver, it suggests it's not being absorbed. Well, as you might imagine, when we published this work, the company that was selling cupric oxide weren't very happy with us. Uh, in fact, I got a phone call. <clears throat> and they said, uh, well, you know, you can't say for sure that the same thing would happen if you were working below the requirement, that is between zero and ten parts per million. I said, well, that's probably true, but it's highly likely that we'd get the same results. And so they kind of put a challenge to, to me, and they said, uh, well, if you can uh, show the same thing or develop an assay that works below the requirement, we'll give you a grant for $25,000, kind of a modest grant. And so we thought, well, this should be easy because we'd had a lot of experience uh, making deficient diets and so forth. <clears throat> so we uh, developed this copper deficient diet. 
It contained only about a half a part per million of copper, only about 5% of the listed requirement. And we began working with this, and we thought, well, this should be easy. And lo and behold, it wasn't easy because copper is a nutrient that the body tends to hang on to. It doesn't turn over very fast. And so in three-week assay <coughs> systems, or three weeks in, in duration, we would feed this diet thinking, well, well maybe we'll get a growth depression. Uh, surely we'll get a decrease in hemoglobin because copper is needed for both iron absorption and transport. <coughs> we got only a small depression in hemoglobin. Then we began looking at copper containing enzymes such as lysyl oxidase and superoxide dismutase and ceruloplasmin, and we could only show a very small decrease in, uh, in these enzymes. So we became, we were very, very frustrated because at this point we didn't have any money. They, they hadn't funded us yet. We had to develop the assay system and we put in a lot of time trying to get this thing to work. Well, finally, we hit upon an assay that we thought would work. We began looking at the gallbladder and noticed that between zero and about one and a half parts per million, keep in mind that the requirement's about here, <coughs> that you get a dramatic and sevenfold and linear increase in biliary copper. You can see why liver doesn't work below the requirement because we're only really increasing it from about 14 parts per million up to 16 with quite enough variability that that would not be the basis of, of a bioassay. Bio <clears throat> so at this point we were encouraged and it's about a year later and we called the company and said well we've got the assay system now and uh, we'd like you to send us the grant money. And uh, probably the most in incredible phone call I've ever had because the guy said, uh, just can you hang on for five minutes? I need to talk to the vice president. He comes back on the phone and he says, uh, we've decided we'll give you the money if you can promise you'll get favorable results. <laughs> and I said, you're not used to dealing with academic scientists, are you? I said, I can guarantee no such thing. In fact, the high likelihood we will get unfavorable results, and I probably slammed the phone down at that point. And I'm sure that the company involved, uh, who shall go nameless, uh, <clears throat> thought, well, we probably have run out of funds, we're not going to pursue this, and so forth. But we were more determined than ever. So we got the lab together and decided, okay, we're going to take a look at this. And to make a long story short, again, we're looking at the slopes of these lines. And whether we looked at bile copper concentration below the requirement or liver copper in the pharmacologic uh, dosing range, we got the same results. Chlorides of copper always came in about 40% better than the standard copper sulfate. Interestingly, cuprous oxide, valence state uh, <clears throat> one instead of two, was 98% as good, but again, uh, cupric oxide was zero. So we published this work and at this point virtually all the uh, companies manufacturing trace mineral premixes for animals uh, discontinued using copper oxide. But uh, several of the companies manufacturing vitamin minerals pills for humans continue to use cupric oxide. Now one reason that they like cupric oxide was because it's 80% copper, you can make a smaller pill than if you use copper sulfate that's only 25% copper. <clears throat> but gradually, m most of these companies began, uh, began changing. We decided to put a little more pressure on them, and I was invited to write an editorial article, and uh, you can see the title of it, and there's, there's a more story to this because the popular press picked up on this as well. It was in the Ladies' Home Journal and all this type of thing, you know. But uh, we thought that this maybe would help put the nail on, in the coffin. And uh, I, I can tell you that there was only one company that held out the longest. I won't name the company except to tell you that in their advertising they used the word silver. <coughs> For those of you that follow advertising. 
in any event, uh, I, I've been told only two months ago that this company finally is changing their source of copper. So that was an interesting experience. Now, when we were doing this work, I got a phone call, it's another case of serendipity, from a colleague at the University of California in Davis. And he's, they had a big cat colony there. And he said, we think we're seeing copper deficiency in our cats. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, this would be chronic. They've, they've been on these diets a long time. And one of, the, one of the things you see with chronic copper deficiency is premature graying of the hair, okay? Because copper is involved in the synthesis of melanin. Uh, it's a component of an enzyme required to synthesize melanin. <clears throat> And they were interested because they had followed our work on copper oxide, and they had been using copper oxide. Well, uh, but they were still confused because they said, you know, we're, we're, we don't think we should be getting copper deficiency, even though we're using copper oxide because we have a lot of liver in our cat diets, and liver is pretty rich in copper. And they said, uh, <clears throat> what do you know about the bioavailability of copper in liver? And I said, I don't know anything about it, but we have an assay that will probably work. We did get some funding for this from a, a, a pet food company. And it turned out to be fairly remarkable in the sense that uh, chicken liver, we compared all this to copper sulfate. And this stands for relative bioavailability, RBV, percent. So chicken, sheep, and beef liver were all good sources of copper, but the pork liver was zero. And of course, pork liver is what's used in pet foods because there's not a big market for it in human food channels. <clears throat> now we have some ideas why pork liver would be lower than the other sources of liver. It's much higher in cysteine, which is an amino acid that can bind copper but we still wouldn't expect it to be zero. This is something that we could have pursued and probably should have or, or somebody should pursue it because it's an interesting uh, question and I don't know the answer to it. And so, but, but we needed to do other things and so we went on with uh, other projects and we let this question hang, why pork liver copper is totally un unavailable. <coughs> Well, about this same time, <clears throat> another case of serendipity, uh, I was uh, scheduled to go to a meeting at the, at the Beckman Center, actually, at the University of California, Irvine campus. And uh, I got, I was supposed to fly into John Wayne International, and the flight was canceled, so I had to fly into LAX. And uh, it turns out I sat on the plane next to a gentleman that uh, we began conversing. Yes, he's a faculty member at the University of California, Irvine, an MD, and I said, what's your specialty? And he said, I'm a hepatologist. We spent the entire flight talking about Wilson's disease. Okay, this is an autosomal recessive copper toxicity problem. It occurs about once every 100,000 live births, <coughs> where copper accumulates in the liver and then the brain, if it's not treated, people die by age 8 to 10. So it's a serious, serious uh, problem. <clears throat> Basically, they absorb too much copper and they excrete too little. And so we talked a great deal about how he treats uh, all these cases of uh, Wilson's disease. And he said he didn't like to use the prescription drug, penicillamine, which is methylated cysteine. And instead, he was using cysteine compounds. He was using excess zinc to retard copper absorption and, and higher doses of ascorbic acid or vitamin C. Well, I was interested in the cysteine compounds because uh, we'd done a lot of work with cysteine. And I said, well, what cysteine compound are you using, the oxidized compound or the reduced compound? He said, I didn't know there were two different ones. Well, there are. And it turns out this is the essential amino acid that can't be synthesized. He was using methionine to treat also. And it can be converted, at least the sulfur moiety of methionine can be converted to cysteine. This is a reduced compound with a free SH group. And then two of these 
molecules can condense to give you cysteine, which is the oxidized co uh, compound. So when I told him about this, he said, well, we've been using this cysteine compound and sometimes methionine. We don't ever use cysteine. And I said, well, our work would suggest that this compound should work a lot better because it has much better metal binding capacity. And uh, so he was intrigued by that and I came home from that meeting and we did some work to basically prove what I had suggested was correct. Again, we're using chicks here and I'm using relative growth and relative liver copper. Uh, setting the positive control at 100 in each case. So no excess copper here and no supplemental sulfur source. So in this case, we gave the chicks 800 parts per million of copper. We knew that that would cause tremendous accumulation of copper in the liver, and, uh, but not in no sulfur source added, at least uh, in a pharmacologic dosing range. 50% growth depression, tenfold increase in liver copper. When we use the reduced compound in the presence of this level of copper, we totally restored growth and totally normalized liver copper. <clears throat> With the, uh, uh, the oxidized compound cysteine that my friend was using, you got some response, but you still had 30% uh, uh, growth depression and a six-fold increase in liver copper. And in fact, the same results occurred with methionine, which is a precursor of these two amino acids. And uh, because the sulfur moiety of these compounds is excreted as sulfate in the urine, uh, we tested inorganic sulfate and not surprising, it was ineffective. Well, when I called my friend back and uh, shared this information, he was quite delighted to get this and I've, we've maintained contact and the bottom line is that he is using this compound now to treat uh, Wilson's disease very uh, effectively and basically has, has discontinued using cysteine and methionine. <clears throat> okay, the next uh, case of serendipity involves, uh, and a lot of these cases involve a grad student that comes to work with you, you know, and uh, vitamin D3 and phosphorus. And if somebody would have told me before we got into this, I'd be working on vitamin D3, one of the most complicated vitamins around, I would have said, no way. But I had this student come into my lab, had done a master's degree at Southern Illinois University, and he was from a rather large pig farm in Southern Illinois, near Belleville. And he said, you know, we had this farm pond and it became overcome with algae and I've read that it might be due to phosphorus uh, pollution. So I want to work on, on uh, phosphorus pollution. So he talked me into it. This is an example of, uh, of eutrophication or hypoxia. This is not the farm pond. This is a small lake in uh, southern Wisconsin adjacent to a large dairy operation. And when you get heavy rains and runoff, some of the waste materials get into the lake. It can also occur from uh, fertilizers put on the soil. And the limiting factor in algae growth is, is phosphorus. And this, so this kind of thing can happen, and it takes dissolved oxygen out of the water, and you get fish kills, a serious problem. Well, the problem resides in the fact that the main source of phosphorus in animal diets is this compound phytic acid or the hexaphosphate of inositol. The problem being that non-ruminant species like humans and pigs and chickens cannot digest this phosphorus. Ruminant animals, cows and sheep for example, they can do this just fine in their, in their rumen. They can, they can break it down. So basically we're consuming a lot of phosphorus that we can't digest and it just passes out in the waste material. Now at this, at this time when we were working on this, just about everybody was taking the approach of trying to come up with an enzyme that would digest uh, phytic acid and phytate chelates because this compound can actually chelate or complex uh, other elements like calcium, zinc, and iron, and so forth. <clears throat> And we decided uh, that we'd kind of like to take a different approach because everybody else was working on enzymes. 
And it seemed to us that enzymes may not be the ideal situation for two reasons, because enzymes being proteins, and if you put them in the diet, they have to pass through the GI tract, and proteolytic enzymes can break them down before they get to the site of action. And secondly, uh, enzymes are heat labile, and most of the feeds and feedstuffs that are used in animal nutrition actually go through some form of heat treatment. A lot of diets are pelleted, for example. Pet food diets are extruded and that type of thing. <clears throat> so we started thinking about vitamin D3 at this point because vitamin D3 clearly is involved in both calcium and phosphorus absorption. It's an interesting vitamin. We can make it in our skin by the action of ultraviolet light. Uh, cholesterol actually is the ultimate uh, precursor. Uh, yes, we do need some cholesterol. We don't have to have it in our diet, but we certainly need to make some cholesterol because it's a precursor not only of vitamin D3, but of also the steroid uh, hormones, the sex hormones, as well as uh, cortisol. Now what happens <clears throat> when we ingest this compound or when we produce it in the skin and it gets transported? It first goes to the liver where an enzyme adds a hydroxyl group at the 25 position. And then a, that, that's the main blood metabolite. And then a small portion of 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol or D3 goes to the kidney and we add another hydroxyl group at the 1 alpha position. And so uh, we decided that we probably needed to first take a look at uh, simply what happens if we titrate greater doses of vitamin D3. This is where serendipity came into the picture. <clears throat> We're talking here about parts per billion, so it requires very, very careful diet preparation, dilution techniques, and so forth. And what we did was to feed graded doses of vitamin D3 in the presence of a phosphorus adequate chicks or phosphorus deficient chicks. Now there's quite a bit of phosphorus in this series over here, but it was all that phytate phosphorus that you can't digest. And this diet had been fortified with inorganic phosphorus, so it was phosphorus adequate. This dose of vitamin D3 was an accident. The grad student, we didn't know this until after the experiment was done, and the grad student came into my office sheepishly and said, you know, this was supposed to be 125 uh, parts per billion, turned out to be 1250, 200 times the requirement. And had I known this before the assay was finished, we might have junked the assay because I would have expected maybe all the chicks would die. Not only did none of the chicks die, they prospered. Uh, so we've really taken a bit of a different view about vitamin D3 toxicity. We used to think it was the most toxic vitamin based on rat work. I think we're beginning to revise our thinking on that, and that's a whole other story. But let me show you the results here. In a phosphorus adequate situation, notice that we use tibia ash. This is basically your shin bone. It's a bone that we can extract from the, from the chick very easily, quantitatively. We can dry it down. We can put it in a muffle furnace and drive off everything but inorganic material. And this is kind of the gold standard for measuring calcium, phosphorus, or vitamin D activity of, of a food or, or, or of a substance. <clears throat> so in the, in the presence of a phosphorus adequate situation, 6.25 parts per billion gives you a big response and nothing beyond that. With a phosphorus deficient situation, however, notice that bone ash, tibia ash, just keeps going up. And even with this 200 uh, full dose of vitamin D3, we kept getting an increase. This gave us the idea that perhaps what's happening here with these high doses of D is that we're getting more of 125 dihydroxy D uh, three being synthesized, and that maybe this was having an effect on phytate phosphorus. 
If this were true, it would have some potential because vitamin D3, unlike enzymes, is heat stable uh, and you wouldn't have to worry about pelleting operations. So again, this is the structure of, of dihydroxy D3. This is actually now considered a hormone called calcitriol. Uh, it's also a prescription drug. It's being used to treat psoriasis and, uh, of course, osteoporosis. And notice that we have the hydroxyl on the 25 position and the 1 alpha position. And there was some data coming out of the University of Georgia suggesting that this may indeed have an effect on phytate phosphorus utilization. At this point in time, we began collaborating with uh, Hector DeLuca at uh, the University of Wisconsin. And Hector is the head of biochemistry at Wisconsin. He is the guru of vitamin D3, uh, has 165 patents, uh, has a small company in Madison that does nothing but make vitamin D compounds, brings a heck of a lot of money into the University of Wisconsin. And uh, so in any event, they made some of this compound for us and we tested it and it, and it worked quite well. And in a conversation I was having with Dr. DeLuca, I said, you know, it would it be, well, I should tell you that the problem of using this compound, which we had found did indeed work in animals, uh, it cost $25,000 a gram to make this compound. It's made chemically. And even though you only need microgram quantities, it's still far too expensive to fly as a feed additive for animals. But in this conversation, I asked DeLuca, I said, you know, would it be possible to just make the one alpha compound and then all that compound would have to do would be to go to the liver and add a, 20, uh, a hydroxide on the 25 position and then you'd have the hormone and the same thing. And he said, wow, that's an interesting idea. I don't know. I don't know if, uh, if you put a hydroxyl on the one alpha if the, if the liver would actually hydroxylate it. Uh, and I don't know what it would cost. Well, that same afternoon, he called me back, and he talked to his former postdoc, who was running this company in Madison for him, and he was all excited. He said, we can make the one alpha compound for $70 a gram. Well, with $70 a gram, it becomes very, very economical as a potential feed additive. So a week later, he shipped me in a small vial a milligram of 1-alpha-hydroxy vitamin D3. That's what it looks like, so we don't have the hydroxyl here. And we could hardly wait to, to test it because we thought we were on to something quite important. Well, we ended up <coughs> doing the assay, and here we're looking at both bone ash and also the, con the qu quantity of phosphorus in the tibia bone. In these kinds of bioassays, you frequently run a you have a phosphorus deficient diet and you, you feed graded doses of inorganic phosphorus to, to get a standard curve. We put in a phytase enzyme that was on the market at that time, a fungal phytase. There are now some phytase enzymes that are E. coli based that are far better. That's a whole nother story. But uh, we put in the hormone calcitriol or 125, a very expensive compound that had a dramatic effect in terms of increasing ash and phosphorus. And lo and behold, when we used the one alpha compound that only cost $70 a gram, it worked equally as well as the expensive uh, <coughs> hormone 125-dihydroxy-D3. Needless to say, we were quite excited. We had a celebration in the lab. And shortly thereafter, notice that this was in 1998, we applied for a patent, and the patent was granted in 1999. And uh, Richard, I'm sorry to say we haven't made any money on this yet for the University of Illinois, but uh, we still hold out hopes that, that we will because we think it has quite a lot of potential. Actually, we've got some FDA concerns because the compound is so bioactive that they worry about hy hypercalcemia. <clears throat> my final story deals with a graduate student that came into my lab from Kenya. We had a, an agreement with the government of Kenya 
that is the College of Agriculture, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences had an agreement to help them establish an ag university in Kenya. So I thought I would try to do my part and help train a person to go back and staff that university. And George was quite a fetching individual. He came into my lab in his mid-40s and uh, announced to me that he wanted to work on niacin. And I tried to dissuade him because even though niacin is exci an exciting vitamin, probably catalyzes at least uh, 200 different uh, enzymatic reactions, uh, I didn't think there was anything new to learn about niacin, and nor did I think we could ever get any funding to do that research. So he left my office kind of hanging his head. And he came back in the next day, not giving up, with this picture of himself. <clears throat> and he said, I had pellagra in my late teens and early 20s. And this is classic pellagra. You have Cassell's necklace. It's a dermatitis around the, uh, the neckline here, dermatitis around the edges of the mouth. And actually, a lot of people can even die of this disease. It's, it's still a problem in parts of Africa and in many other underdeveloped countries. And so I was quite impressed with this picture, and uh, we began talking a bit about the history of, of pellagra, which is, is quite an interesting uh, uh, history, because uh, at the turn, of the, century, uh, the turn of the 20th century, uh, the early 1900s, we had a lot of people dying in the United States of pellagra. Uh, actually, niacin deficiency, pellagra is where we got the terminology for the four Ds, that are associated with uh, deficiency, namely diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and death. And uh, the US Public Health Service thought this was a communicable infectious disease. And so they took a bacteriologist from the US Public Health Service and they sent him down to Mississippi because people were dying in nursing homes and prisons and orphanages. This man's name was Joseph Goldberger. And he went down to uh, Mississippi and uh, quickly decided that he didn't think it was a, an infectious disease because the inmates were getting sick, but the staff workers were not getting sick, okay? And to convince himself, he actually convinced his wife and 14 volunteers to go on the same diet that the inmates were consuming and over a two-month period, they began getting some of these symptoms. So quickly, they changed their diet. So he now was convinced it was a dietary problem. And he found out that he could add a little bit of liver or yeast or wheat germ to the diet and prevent the disease from occurring. Uh, <clears throat> but really, the breakthrough was when he fed the prison diets and the orphanage diets to some dogs over a six-month period. And he developed an animal model, namely, he, he developed black tongue. And uh, so now we have an animal model where we can study niacin-containing foods and that type of thing. Actually, it was about 20 years later, 1937 to be exact, that uh, Conrad Alvium at the University of Wisconsin actually isolated niacin from liver. And uh, he took the pure chemical then and fed it to some dogs that had black tongue and cured it and so forth and so on. A lot of people wonder why Alvium didn't win a Nobel Prize. Probably the reason is that 70 years earlier, chemists, a chemist in Germany had actually synthesized niacin. He oxidized nicotine with nitric acid and produced niacin. But he tested it against beriberi, which was a thiamine deficiency disease that was plaguing Europe. And of course, it didn't work, so they just let it set on the shelf. So kind of an interesting history. But in any event, I told George, uh, I was impressed now that, uh, that we'd have to try to find some funding and let George study niacin and pellagra. And I said, come up, let's come up with some good questions. And so we came up with three critical questions. Uh, his main question was, why do some people on low niacin and low tryptophan, tryptophan's an amino acid, and it's a precursor, it, some of it can be converted to niacin, so why people on low niacin, low tryptophan diets get pellagra while some other people do not? 
Secondly, why does poor protein quality, which just really means lysine deficiency, lysine being one of the essential amino acids, why does that exacerbate pellagra? Okay, we knew that, we just didn't know why. And the literature, and George found this literature, why does coffee consumption ameliorate pellagra? And I told George, I said, well, I think we can answer the third question real quickly because we had worked on this about 20 years earlier. And uh, most people think coffee has no nutrition. I'm sorry, it does. It's a pretty good source of niacin. So we took some chicks and we put them on a niacin-free diet. We provided enough tryptophan to meet the requirement for protein synthesis, but with no excess that could be converted to niacin. We fed greater doses of niacin, got a dramatic growth response, and then added either four or eight percent coffee and got a terrific uh, growth response, about a 75 percent growth response. And based on this standard curve, you can calculate the niacin activity in coffee. Now this looks fairly straightforward, it actually wasn't, because when we initially did this, <clears throat> we did it with freeze-dried regular coffee that contains caffeine, and instead of getting responses, we got depressions, and that led us on another kind of an ancillary trip, because we began looking at caffeine toxicity, but this actually is freeze-dried decaffeinated coffee, okay, and it does have to provide niacin. Well, we went to the metabolic uh, pathways, and uh, one of the things that first jumped up, this X means that we're not providing, we're providing enough tryptophan to meet the need for protein, so we don't have to have any of the tryptophan going this direction. Tryptophan can also be, about 3% of the flux can go to serotonin. A lot of interest in this. Some of my colleagues are working on this, actually, because serotonin uptake inhibitors uh, is a hot topic to try to control depression and so forth. But the thing that struck us was that two of the enzymatic uh, pathways leading from tryptophan to this complicated compound known as amino carboxymuconic acid semialdehyde required iron. And so the first question I put to George was, were you by any chance anemic? And he said, yes, I was anemic all during this period. My hemoglobin was running only about eight or nine. I said, well, probably you're not getting a very efficient conversion of tryptophan to, uh, to niacin, either actually nicotinate mononucleotide, which is a coenzyme form of, of niacin. So to make a long story short, we developed assays, and it's pretty tricky to do this when you're manipulating several different nutrients at once, namely we're manipulating tryptophan, iron, and niacin. And to make a long story short, George proved in his thesis work that when iron is adequate, this is the yield of niacin from tryptophan, 42 milligrams of tryptophan yield, one milligram of niacin. But when iron is modestly deficient, 51 milligrams yield one milligram of niacin, so less efficient. And when it's quite severely deficient, it takes 63 milligrams of tryptophan to yield one milligram of niacin. So we were quite pleased the way this came out, and most textbooks now describing pellagra list uh, an endemic anemia as one of the factors. Well, we kind of dropped this. George finished his PhD, went back to Kenya, and he's a professor now in their university. But we were still intrigued by this protein quality aspect, and uh, I had another student who happens to be in the audience came over, came back from his position in Indiana, and he agreed to work on this with me, uh, along with Colleen, my, my technician. And basically, we had the idea that uh, we realized that alpha ketoadipic acid is a key intermediate in the catabolism of tryptophan in the main pathway of catabolism. The CO2, but lysine is also a precursor of alpha ketoadipate in its main catabolic pathway. And so our hypothesis was that these low lysine, poor protein quality diets uh, were getting so little alpha ketoadipate from lysine that we're increasing the flux this way and getting less niacin synthesized. 
Well, we thought and thought how we could test that, and we just couldn't come up with a way to do that that wouldn't be confounded, because now we're manipulating lysine, we're manipulating iron, we're manipulating tryptophan and niacin. So we took the different approach. We said, well, maybe an excess dose, a pharmacologic dose of lysine, would cause a buildup of this compound, and that this would end product inhibit this metabolic reaction here, this enzymatic reaction, and cause more flux toward niacin. So maybe excess niacin would actually be ameliorative. We're still working on this, and we would like to be, we would like to get set up to measure this enzyme and so forth. But the bottom line is that when, <clears throat> when uh, niacin is adequate, and you give excess lysine, that's the green bar, 10,000 milligrams per kilogram, you get the expected depression in weight gain or growth. But at all three of these deficient doses of niacin, you actually get a response to excess lysine. So we think that lysine and alpha-ketoadipate is controlling the amount of uh, niacin that we're getting via that pathway. So let me say in conclusion, very simply, serendipity works. Uh, it works in science. It's, it, it's certainly worked in my laboratory and most of you in the audience that have done hypothesis-driven research have experienced the same thing. It works in manufacturing. And my favorite story here has to do with uh, the development of ivory soap at Procter & Gamble in 1879. There was a technician in charge of mixing the soap, the mixer, and uh, he, I've gotten a little more detail on this, he was a young man and he was infatuated by this female worker on the floor and he made a date for lunch and he got so excited he went to lunch and he didn't turn off the mixing bat. He came back and he noticed there was more volume in there than he thought there should be but Harley Proctor at this time was a stickler on detail. He had messages up on the wall and everything, don't make mistakes, follow these directions exactly. So he covered it up. And they went ahead and manufactured this soap. And they put it into bars and put it on the market. And all of a sudden, they started getting these phone calls and letters. We want more of this soap. It floats in the bathtub. And uh, so Harley Proctor, who was CEO of Proctor & Gamble at this time, uh, ran down to the floor and says, I want to meet this young man that made this discovery. I want to give him a raise. So he did. He gave the guy a raise. And uh, to this day, ivory soap, you know, 99, 44 hundredths percent pure. They don't add any coloring. They don't add any aromatizing agent or anything probably the most profitable product that Procter & Gamble has ever manufactured or sold. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, the, uh, the name Ivory came about by serendipity. Harley Proctor was sitting in church, and the minister began reading Psalm 45. And in that psalm, they mentioned Ivory Palaces. And as soon as he heard that, he said, that's it. We're going to call it Ivory. Okay. And of course, we experience it in our personal lives. Uh, how many times haven't we heard stories about how people have met their spouse by pure accident and so forth? Well, let me finish by simply acknowledging that I've had a great group of grad students, some of these are postdocs as well, that have helped in these projects, done most of the work. <clears throat> My secretary, Nancy David, I have a great group of colleagues at the University of Illinois, this list is not complete, who have either been involved in some of the projects I've talked about or given me intellectual stimulation or maybe emotional stimulation. And of course, you, you can't really complete anything if you don't have a good lab and farm staff. And my lab tech, Colleen Shear and Chet Utterbach, who is a manager of our poultry farm, and Pam Otterbach, who works in our lab. So with that, I'll stop, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.
Yeah, I'd, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Yes. How well does the uh, research on chicken pigs transfer to human beings? Well, yeah, that's always a question, and in some cases, you you have to you have to go to a primate model. Uh, we think that the pig is probably one of the best animal models for for the human. Their GI tract is very very similar, but we've also found in most cases that using a chick model uh, often predicts what's going to happen in the pig. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure I understood the question. Could you? <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I could have given you examples uh, where something is very different in, uh, you know, between species. Uh, the, the copper uh, information I talked to you about, we actually did rat work, we did pig work, and we did chick work. We got the same answer in all three species. And uh, the problem with trying to repeat a lot of these things with humans is you can't use invasive procedures. You know, I don't think many humans would sign up for a trial where they're going to let you take a liver sample, you know. And, and the fact of the matter is with copper, these blood measures are, are not very worthwhile. But it's a good question. Yes? I heard that uh, the animal dies of natural causes, dies of the nutrition deficiency. What do you think of that? Uh, I probably would have to say I don't agree with it. <laughs> I think, uh, I think, actually most, most food animals, we don't keep around long enough to let them die of natural causes. We do, however, keep companion animals around and, uh, you know, they die of heart attacks just like humans do. I, I don't think it's due to a nutritional deficiency. Yes, in the back again. They came under the corporate uh, retreat that they had a health person come in there and really blew the, you mentioned the silver vitamin, which is what they uh, uh -huh. not really identified, but they said the, the vitamins that are pressed in pills really don't work well in the body because you go out and get powdered vitamins and things like that. Is that maybe the veterinary people respond to? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say I don't agree with that. I, I think that uh, the, these com I mean, let, let's face it, there's, there's maybe four or five companies that are the ones mainly making all the vitamins. I mean, there's a lot of people that sell them, put their own private label on them, but they don't really manufacture the vitamins. And the vitamins that are pressed into pills have been tested, you know. I mean, they, they go through some of the same kind of animal tests that I've used for bioavailability. So I think that's probably an old wives tale that a powdered vitamin is better than a pill. Uh, well, that's a very that's a real loaded question, Chet. I mean, some some vitamins are better assimilated if taken with food. Some are better if taken without food, is the answer to that. Yeah. Yeah, Bob? I think... Yeah, the, the, the question was, what's the future of using animal models uh, in, in research? And in my view, I, I think it's, it's almost essential. 
I think we have to have animal models. Uh, clearly, it was the key to the discovery of the vitamins and, and in many cases, the minerals. Unless you have an animal, you just simply can't do some of these things with humans. And, and to try to do it even with a primate is, is incredibly expensive. So I think we have to start out with animal models. In the back. Can you speak up? Not sure I'm following that. Yeah. I I I think uh, Diego. One of the concerns is that uh, in in today's world, with the kind of funding that we have, that it's it's more it's becoming more and more difficult to adventure on a sidetrack because we have certain objectives we have to try to get done and uh, so you know it, it's become harder I think to pursue ancillary ideas. That, that's the problem and you know I guess in a sense I've been fortunate because I've had some corporate donors that d would give me just some unrestricted funding so I, I, I usually had some funding that I could set aside to do special projects okay but I probably most people don't have that. Turned up another comment, then, and that is that a lot of this uh, research money now coming from federal funds and so forth is almost contract. And if you don't follow the contract, you put the bricks in place, you're done. That's right. It's very unfortunate. Yeah. I mean, obviously, this question raises a lot of questions in itself. But there is this wonderful story about uh, John Bardeen. Uh, one of his colleagues told him. Uh, the grant money was being cut in half and he was complaining. Bardeen looked at him and said, hmm, I guess we'll get some work done now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes? Well, I've been sent here by a few teenage girls. They're in high school, 17, 18 year old. And they heard you were speaking, but they couldn't come because there's too much homework. Anyway, their interest is in protein consumption. One of them was convinced somehow that taking a powdered protein was going to be a wonderful thing and tried to convince others. And my daughter, who's going to graduate and join up with some biological study groups in place, so maybe here, maybe at the UCLA, she said, wait a minute. And then she, she heard you were well, we have estimates of what the minimum protein requirement is, and there's probably active debate about maybe whether there's some benefits of consuming more than that minimum amount, uh, particularly in terms of uh, weight control. Uh, but I guess this prompts me to say that uh, there's a lot of people out there giving nutritional advice that are probably not qualified to give it. 
this came up in the radio interview today, and uh, the caller said that uh, I wasn't aware of this, that, uh, that Dr. Phil and Larry King uh, are now producing some form of health foods or something, selling supplements and that type of thing. Uh, you know, some of the powdered proteins are based on collagen, which is a very, very poor source of protein. And uh, so you have to be careful and get the right information uh, to answer some of these questions because a lot of people are promoting health foods and uh, there probably has not been a lot of efficacy data behind that, but there's a profit motive involved. Well, forget the chondroitin, it doesn't do anything. Uh, glucosamine sulfate, there's some positive evidence for it, although recently you may have read that uh, people are beginning to question that. But the interesting thing about glucosamine sulfate for joint health, it's not the glucosamine, it's the fact that glucosamine transports sulfate to the joints, and it's a sulfate that is doing whatever it's supposed to be doing, and some people question that. But the chondroitin, that's a great example, Phil, because chondroitin sulfate is part of, you know, mucopolysaccharides, and so they think, well, we should consume chondroitin. Well, it, it doesn't do anything. That's, a, that's fallacious. Well, there's not any really good uh, efficacy data on MSN either, but it's being sold in the health food stores. <laughs> you, you mean brain food? <laughs> definitely correct that there's a lot of uh, herbal ancient kinds of things that have, have occurred you know in, in China and places like that that probably have not been tested here in the states that that may have some some benefits the whole area of functional foods of you know whether you're talking about flavonoids or whatever it's controversial but it's an active area of research and there's probably some components of foods that we're examining now that may have some benefits or may have some deleterious effects if you consume too much. Uh, clearly, we're, we have the capacity today through genetic engineering, transgenics, and so forth to, uh, to actually change food crops. And the best example of this, uh, vitamin A deficiency is one of the most common deficiencies in the world. You get night blindness, uh, macular degeneration, and they've now engineered more vitamin A activity into rice in the Asian countries. It's called golden rice. It's now being grown, and it's likely to have tremendous benefit in preventing vitamin A deficiency in, in that part of the world. Yeah, that's probably right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, sulfation reactions occur in the joints. And uh, 
there's actually publications that, that show that. It's the glucosamine that's transporting the sulfate to the joints. I mean, other sources of sulfate, like potassium sulfate, you can easily consume. doesn't do the same thing. Five years ago, I had a knee replacement. And the, the orthopedic surgeon said, looking at the x ray in a year, we'll be doing the other. That was five years ago. I haven't, I still have the, uh, haven't had the other one replaced. Uh, and I kind of think that the glucosamine doesn't, I think it helps lubricate it. Mm -hmm. Probably doesn't lay down any more carbon, but I think it does help lubricate it. This ties in the pressure of training. Yeah. Transferring both. I, I think the key is if, if glucosamine seems to be working, uh, based on the literature, I would suggest that you definitely get glucosamine sulfate, not glucosamine chloride. Say that again. Get glucosamine sulfate and not glucosamine chloride. Okay, because it's a sulfate that's doing the job.